So I'm Ross Boucher, um, and I realize kind of after the fact that the title of this talk is maybe a little bit cryptic. Um, what does it mean to clone a server, and maybe why would you want to do that? Uh, so I thought I would start by kind of explaining the problem we were trying to solve, um, and uh, through that, hopefully, giving you an idea of, of how we use Docker to do it. Uh, so the project I work on is called Tonic, as you mentioned. And it's essentially uh, a prototyping tool for Node.js. Uh, if you're familiar with systems like IPython, uh, it's a very similar tool, but for Node. Uh, another way to think of it is as a REPL, which if you're not familiar, which probably most of you are, it stands for Redevelop Print Loop. And it's the program you get dumped into if you type, say, Python or Node in your terminal. Uh, and, and the things that make a REPL a REPL or you can type some code, get a result, uh, and keep iterating on that, and the program state sort of builds up over time. And so what we've done is build a web-based version of this. It runs in the browser, you type your code, we send that code over to our servers, which spin up containers with Docker, uh, evaluate the code, and send a result back to the browser. Uh, I'm gonna show you how that works in a little bit more detail later. Uh, so one of the sort of problems we had with the way REPLs work is that they're append only. So if I run a bunch of steps uh, and then I want to change something in the middle, you know, maybe I want to tweak some parameter, I've got to essentially probably up arrow a few times, change my thing, run that one, and then run each subsequent command. Uh, and that's not a great experience. Um, and systems like IPython uh, have very similar problems where you can actually re-execute any cell in your document uh, out of order, and there's no way when looking at a document to really understand the execution flow. Uh, and so what we wanted was a tool that was easy to read, the code sort of executed from top to bottom just like any source file you'd expect, um, without losing the sort of interactivity and speed benefits of being in a REPL. Uh, and that, that's actually the hard part, because it's pretty easy to keep a process open and just sort of keep appending commands to it. Uh, similarly, it would be pretty easy to just run the file from scratch every time. Um, but then that can get pretty slow if you've got any kind of complicated step anywhere in the process. Uh, so what we did was we built a system that actually creates a copy of the running process uh, in between each step. So after running each step of code, we copy the entire node process uh, and then keep going, and then later on, you can make a change anywhere in the document, and we'll restore, we'll restore the process to that point and apply your change. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick demo so that it doesn't sound quite so abstract. So this is Tonic. Um, and it is, unsurprisingly, runs JavaScript. Um, and you know I have access to the results from the past as I run my JavaScript. And just to kind of prove that this is not running in the browser. Uh, I'll read the directory. Uh, so like we're really running on a real file system, or at least a sort of virtualized container file system. Um, and you can do some cool things with this. So I can actually go ahead and remove a file, say this one. and you'll see it's not there anymore. Um, but because we're checkpointing not only the process, using Docker we actually checkpoint the whole file system. Uh, I can go in here, and I can read the file that I've already erased. Not ETFY. Uh, Yes, and my computer is freezing. The demo gods, I didn't have any coffee. Uh, and there it is, there's our file. Um, and you know, like maybe I don't actually care about any of this, I can throw away these cells, I can still do something with X, it's still sitting there waiting for me. Um, and I can go ahead and change history 
and watch the change propagate to the future. And all the while, this initial random seed didn't change. So I could talk about this forever, but probably that would be boring. Um, so how did we do it? Uh, the key, as he already mentioned, is this tool called Cryu, uh, and that stands for Checkpoint Restore in User Space. Uh, and essentially what this tool is doing is it sits on your host machine uh, as a user level application and it asks the kernel for every piece of available information about a running process. It grabs the full contents of memory, it grabs file descriptors, it grabs open network connections, um, and it grabs information most importantly about sort of process trees and C groups, which is really important for working with Docker. And, and so working with Docker is like the next step of the puzzle. Um, and because of the way these tools work, it's actually really important that uh, they're integrated at a pretty low level in order, in order to make the process work. Uh, you know, so we're spinning up these containers on demand using the remote API, and that is maybe relatively straightforward to understand, but in order for Docker to understand uh, once you've restored a process or checkpointed a process, to understand how the state is changing, Docker needs to be able to see those things running. In fact, it needs to run the commands itself. Um, and so when we set it, started working on this a little over a year ago, uh, Saeed, who is here, uh, had just posted a video on YouTube showing the first integration of Cryu and Docker. Um, and he works at Google, and this was, I think, sort of a maybe a 20% time project there for him, I'm not sure. Uh, and so that was really exciting, and we sort of used that as a launching point. But as all you have probably noticed, Docker moves very quickly. So by the time we got to it, the code was sort of already stale and not running on the, on the latest Docker. So I took over a little bit at that point and, and sort of rebased the project to master. And that was, well, that was a while ago. And uh, I'll talk about the current state of that uh, towards the end. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to do now was kind of show you a very high level overview of, of our system and then walk you through uh, one instance of this process. So at a very high level, um, you have sort of taken from left to right. Uh, the first two blocks are not that surprising. You know, the users come through their browser, through the internet, and talk to our sort of front end servers, uh, talks to our application server, which is running in Docker, sort of in this middle network. Um, and obviously there's a whole bunch of things missing there, like databases and, and things like that. Uh, and then this second piece in the middle is uh, what we call the evaluation controller. And it's the, serv the process that sort of manages spinning up these containers um, and checkpointing and restoring. And it has that sort of yellow outline that you maybe can barely see here. Um, because to sort of show that it ha actually has mounted the Docker socket. Uh, that's how we use the Docker remote API to do everything. Um, and this, this third network, you'll see we've got another little whale there. Uh, it's because we're actually also running two instances of Docker. So as I was kind of just mentioning, this, this was a sort of custom patch that we built. So we're running a custom version of Docker uh, in production uh, and we, use the only, we only use that custom version to manage the, the containers we want to checkpoint and restore uh, using like modern current Docker for everything else. So traffic kind of flows from left to right here and then eventually you get results back. Uh, so oh, the other interesting point to note here is that these uh, pool of containers, so what we do is we have a pool of running sort of generic worker containers and those are ready to accept user's code at any point in time uh, and, and return results really quickly. So the idea is we want, you know, within 10 milliseconds to be able to take some code, evaluate it, and return the result. Uh, and all of that stuff is running in an isolated network. So those containers can't see any of our own uh, app containers or databases, um, and they can't talk to each other either, which is really important, obviously, for security reasons. Okay, so. Uh, the starting point of this process, the user types some code in, and, and we have a WebSocket that we keep open. And the message looks something approximately like this. Uh, and the key pieces of information here are 
There's a URL, which is kind of just a generic uh, identifier for a notebook. And there's this list of cells. And the cells have, obviously, they have source code. Uh, and they have this checksum, which is a really important part of how this system works. So the checksum is essentially a checksum of, of the source code so that we can tell when the source changes that we need to invalidate uh, the existing checkpoint on the system. But it's, it's actually a cumulative checkpoint. So it's a checksum of itself and of the checksums of all the previous cells. So if you invalidate uh, any checksum in, in the full notebook's history, it will immediately invalidate all the subsequent checksums. So that's how we can do sort of really fast uh, caching and prediction of these checkpoints. So we send this message. And then the application server talks to the evaluation controller and says, hey, I need a new evaluator um, for this notebook identifier and this checksum. And you'll notice that it doesn't send the code. Um, and that's actually pretty important. Uh, and we'll see how the code gets sent uh, in a second. So the evaluation controller looks at this pool of containers. And it essentially has uh, three choices to make. Uh, in these first two cases, uh, we're dealing with uh, a container that we've already checkpointed and seen before. So that's not the case here. So we're basically just going to skip to the third, the third if statement and return a container from our sort of pre-available pool. Uh, and obviously, once we do that, we sort of put another one on. So there's always a series of containers waiting. Uh, so now the evaluation controller has this uh, worker sitting around. And it tells the app server, here's you know, sort of the network details to talk to it. So the way our system works. Every worker opens its own socket, and the, the application and, and the worker then talk directly over that socket um, using a custom protocol that looks kind of something like this. Um, you know, there's some like initialization, uh, and then essentially a loop where the worker says, hey, I need the source code for the next cell. Uh, the app sends it over, it evaluates it, and it sends it back. And so this is actually really important. Uh, it's important to do this sort of like just-in-time sending of the code, because we can't, when we checkpoint uh, the container, we can't have it have already seen you know, the whole code. If we want to change the past, we can't have it have already evaluated all the source code in the document. So every checkpoint, the container has only seen exactly the source code up to that moment in time in the notebook. Uh, the application server sends the output back, which is you know, not exciting at all. Um, but at the same time, what happens is the app server then tells the evaluation controller, hey, you know, we've just run one cell. This is the moment in time where you should create a checkpoint. And then the evaluation controller talks to Docker over the Docker socket. Um, and it runs essentially this code. Um, Cry, so checkpoint is the command that actually calls out to cryu. And it, cryu has sort of a billion configuration options. Um, but fortunately, almost none of that makes it up to the Docker level. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, so the only things we're passing here are sort of where do I want to store the checkpoint on disk. The checkpoint is really just a collection of files. Uh, and we tell cryu that we want to leave the process running after we've checkpointed it. And the typical behavior once you checkpoint is to exit the process. But obviously, because our system is sort of continuing after each cell, we want to keep it running. The second thing we do uh, is, like I was showing in the demo, we also ask Docker if there have been any, been any changes to the file system. And if there have, we actually do a Docker commit and keep a copy of that file system as well, so that when we restore, we are restoring the sort of full process file system pair. Uh, and then finally, we sort of write some metadata about all that to disk. Um, this is kind of just an alternate view of the same thing. So I wanted to show you, if you wanted to play around with it, what the command line would look like. Uh, so there's actually two versions here, because we're about to change how everything works. Uh, the version that we're running, and then if you've interacted with this uh, before on my website, uh, it looks like this first thing you call checkpoint. Uh, and then Docker commit is, is the same that you'd expect. Uh, in the new version, checkpoint is one of these Docker subcommands. So there'll be checkpoint create for creating a checkpoint, um, checkpoint ls to list, and, and you can delete checkpoints that way. So there's like a whole new interface. Um, after we've done the process for one cell, 
we just loop through for as many cells as there are, and eventually the process will exit once it's finished processing. Um, and at that point is when we actually restore the containers. So this is, this is actually kind of the, the cloning moment. Uh, and what we do is we do a predictive restore of where we think you're going to want to evaluate next. So when you run a whole document, um, the process exits, and we go ahead and immediately restore the end of the document so that the next time you type, uh, we'll have a container ready for you in hopefully about 10 milliseconds. Uh, similarly, you know, sometimes we restore more than that, so we might have multiple copies of the same process running at different points in the document. So again, this is the mirror image of checkpointing. The evaluation controller talks over the Docker daemon to uh, the worker, it checkpoints it, um, sorry, it restores it. What, the way that works is actually you, you create a new Docker container and then you call restore. Um, and then as you see sort of this last line is we store that, that running container in, in a lookup table that we access uh, in another function that I'll show you in a second. Uh, and again, I just wanted to show you quickly the CLI version of the same thing. Uh, and again, it's changing. So restore is currently a top level command if you're running the code that's on my GitHub, um, but it's moving to just a flag that you'll pass to start. So generically in a container that you want to start up, you'll be able to start from a specific checkpoint, which makes a lot of logical sense. Um, so I'm pretty sure that this is what's gonna actually land. And this mirrors, by the way, the API that's available sort of at the container D and run C level if you've used checkpoint restore, which is in both of those tools. Okay, so that's essentially what happens with one process. And then just to very quickly show you what happens as you continue to edit, you can see here I've added another cell. Uh, it has its own new checksum. And then when I send that over, just to skip to the interesting bit, uh, instead of going to that last pooled container, we're actually gonna be in this first cache container block. We're gonna say, oh hey, I've seen this checksum before, uh, and I've got this predicted evaluator running, so I'm gonna return it immediately. Um, if it didn't, and we hit this second block, that's the case where we've created a checkpoint, but you know maybe this was a while ago and, and eventually we killed it because we're not just gonna leave everything running forever. Um, and so the first and last situation are pretty fast. You know, we're typically able to return a container in tens of milliseconds. Uh, in the middle case, that's the slower one, but still we're talking about maybe a few hundred milliseconds to restore the container and then, and then return it. Okay, so that's basically the whole thing in a nutshell. Um, and hopefully you were here at the talk right before mine where quite a lot more interesting things were said about container security than I'm going to. Um, these are some very high level things that you should be thinking about. Uh, certainly the remote API gives you the ability to set constraints and drop capabilities that you don't need uh, and you should definitely be doing that. Uh, similarly, turn on user namespaces, make sure you're isolating worker containers from your other, the other parts of your network. Um, this last thing, seccomp, you should definitely be using it if you can. Uh, unfortunately, in Cryo, you need to be running a very modern kernel to use seccomp. I'm not totally sure. I think it's 4.0.6, maybe. Um, but I'm sure if you uh, ask someone afterwards, they'll give you a sort of specific answer. Um, there are definitely a lot of problems we ran into when building this. Um, a large portion of them were sort of AUFS uh, failures or cryu failures that have since been fixed um, with very little effort on our part. Um, progress has been made. And so uh, the newer kernel you're able to run on uh, and the new newest version of cryu you're able to run on is gonna solve a lot of the problems. Some of the things we still have issues with uh, when these things fail, we end up with sort of zombie problem, uh, zombie processes and, and things that the Docker daemon gets very unhappy about and, and sort of in a state sometimes where you can't restart it. So we have a bunch of cleanup scripts and sometimes have to sort of dump the entire state of Docker in order to restart. Okay, so all of that is kind of a little bit abstract um, and I thought that when I was putting this talk together, it might be useful to have just a little bit of sample code that you could actually run on your own. So I put this repo up on GitHub, uh, and I will quickly sort of show you what it does and, and how it works. So 
Uh, this is a pretty simple tool for managing, managing essentially a pool of containers that you can configure on demand uh, and process things with. So we use Node.js for pretty much everything. Um, and in Node, we use this library called Docker Road. Is this big enough to read, hopefully? Um, and Docker Road manages all our actual Docker communications. So you can see we talk to the socket here. Um, we create a pool of containers. And really, the, the key function here is this get worker. Um, which you call and, and you provide it a function to initialize that worker. And it sort of pulls one off the pool uh, and it calls this initialize function and it deals with sort of managing some of the runtime states so containers can be sort of the initializing process and the running process they can, and they'll eventually be terminated. And really a lot of the work here is actually just managing the state of Docker and making sure you're handling, reacting correctly to appropriate events. Uh, so uh, sort of quick use of that, like the, the mirror side, here's the example that's in this repo if you check it out. Um, and it's an extremely trivial example, um, but hopefully it will get the idea across. So this essentially creates a little web server in Node um, that will respond to requests and uh, create a Nginx worker container that just, and redirect you to that worker. Uh, so it will read the, the requests URL and you can send it a little message. And then what it does is it gets a worker and actually uses Docker exec to, to write your message to the, the index.html file of that Nginx container. Um, and then it redirects you here to, it, it gets the details about the running container and then just issues an immediate redirect. So uh, we can run this with Docker for Mac. Or not? Ah. Uh, and so now, if we take a look, we've got a few containers running in our pool. And if we go ahead and go, and maybe we will say, hello to DockerCon. Very uh, simple demo, but if you can see, we've now got another container in our pool, and uh, this guy here is actually serving our direct uh, message here. And you can see the port. We got redirected to 32781, um, which somehow is not in this. Oh, here it is. It's just wrapped. So yeah, so that is a very, it's, it's not necessarily something I would use in production. Um, but if you kind of want some sample code for how all this stuff works, this is a pretty good starting point. Um, okay, so uh, I promised that I would maybe give you a bit of an update on sort of the history of this project. So uh, when I first got Checkpoint Restore working in Docker, it was in May of last year. So it was kind of a while ago. Um, and I put, submitted this as a pull request and uh, over the course of, I don't know, maybe nine months or so, probably had to rebase this project about 10 to 20 times because uh, the Docker code base has been moving really fast. And what they've been doing is taking a lot of the subcomponents of Docker and pulling them out into separate repos. Uh, and eventually, uh, we sort of hit a wall and there was like no longer any possibility of compatibility between my pull request and, and the future. So. A couple of months ago, we opened up a new one, um, which represents the current state of everything. And uh, progress has been pretty good. Um, this is probably a good time to sort of mention all the people that have, have been involved in this process. Um, the people at the Cryo team have been incredibly helpful. Um, Andre and Pavel are here. And if you see them around the conference, you should say hi. Uh, a lot of people on, on the Docker team, including Michael, um, and others have been super helpful in, in helping me understand how this code works. And I, I, we've now gotten sort of all of the lower level components of Docker supporting Checkpoint and Restore. So Containerd, Run C, uh, the Engine API repo supports this. So we're at the very last step. Um, and hopefully, uh, if there's some interest coming out of this talk, they'll be, they'll be interested in, in moving forward. Um, and I think the networking stuff that they just talked about in today's keynote is actually also, oh, by the way, I think I'm probably single-handedly responsible for taking that uh, less than one day me, uh, median 
the file pull request time and, and making the average like six days. So I think that's my very old pull request. Um, yeah, so the, the, the real sort of big talking point here is container migration. Um, and what else might you do? So our use case is maybe a little bit niche uh, for Cryu. And, and it turns out I think that there are a lot of interesting niche use cases. And I, I get a handful of emails every week with new people uh, trying to use this project. Uh, one of the things that people do is sort of uh, reproducible debugging. So they might have some complicated problem that takes a lot of setup work. And what they want to do is, is sort of get their process into a state and create a checkpoint so that they can restore it and, and do sort of iterative debugging uh, in a much more sane way. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. One of them is uh, you can restart a whole host machine and then restore your processes. Um, you can restart the daemon and restore your host processes, which is becoming a little less interesting uh, now that Docker is separating itself from the, the underlying processes. But uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of sort of interesting use cases. Um, but the, the big one that everyone is, is sort of very interested in, in is container migration. Um, and I think the Docker networking stuff that was shown today uh, is going to make a lot of this really easy. So the, the trickiest parts of getting container migration working are really about getting the networking working right. So I do have one sort of last demo of container migration that I'm going to show you. Um, so I've got these two machines running uh, on Amazon. And they've got Docker running. They're not running any services. So I'm going to run this HLS uh, streaming video demo that I pulled off the internet. And it's basically unmodified. Um, and I put it into a Docker container. So that's going to get running. In front of my two Docker instances, I've put an Amazon Elastic Load Balancer. So hopefully it's picked it up by now. And you can see I've got this streaming video which is the most boring possible streaming video, but will serve us well for a demo. Um, and so this is uh, the load balancer's view of it. And we're running on server two. So if I take a look at server two, um, it should actually load the video. Uh, and if we look at server one, just to sort of prove that I'm not lying, there's nothing running. OK. So there are, uh, the Docker team has put, to, uh, sorry, the Creo team has put together a sort of wrapper tool to make live migration somewhat easier. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy to do what I'm going to do. Uh, but as you want to do more complex things, it gets increasingly complex. So we need to do basically two things. On the target machine, we're going to start uh, the listening service. So phall is going to listen for connections uh, of future containers. And then on the container, on the system that's running the container, we're going to initiate the transfer. So again, we're using phall. Uh, we tell it the target machine where we want the container to be transferred to. We tell it we're using Docker. And then we just need to give it the ID of our Docker container, so fe0. It's going to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, what it's doing right now, and hopefully you can see that we're still streaming video in the background, uh, is it's going to rsync the entire file system over. So if we were doing something more complex with the file system, all of that would be handled automatically. Uh, then it's going to checkpoint the container. It's going to transfer that container uh, on over to the other machine and restore it into the daemon. It's going to be the, exactly the same container with the same process ID and the same uh, container ID. Uh, OK. And even though it ends with an error, it actually works. That's demos for you. Uh, OK, so we take a look. Docker is no longer running that container. And if we go over here, uh, there it is. It's got the same command, the same ID. Uh, it's our same container. Uh, and you can see here, we never stop streaming. Thank you. Uh, if we take a look, you'll see server two is no longer running. And uh, if we look at server one, it's got our streaming video. So that is sort of in a nutshell. Um, the time difference is just because the way HLS works. Uh, that's, that's basically checkpoint in restore in a nutshell. And it looks super simple. 
Uh, it's actually incredibly complicated. Um, this is using reconnection. So, you know, you can have this magic world where your SSH session transfers over and it requires a lot more configuration at the network level. Uh, I cheated and just let it reconnect. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, here's just kind of a list of a bunch of resources related to Checkpoint Restore. Um, I'm gonna put this up probably on my Twitter or something, um, and you'll be able to click the links. And I have on my GitHub released a version of Checkpoint Restore that's been built on Docker 1.10, and that's what most people have been using for a while. Um, I have the working version of 1.12 that I'm going to put up on GitHub as well, so you'll be able to download that. Unfortunately, it's just a lot more complicated to run because there are like five binaries that you need to have instead of the old system where you had just one. Uh, and that's it. So I think now we're gonna do questions. Hi, thanks. Sorry. Uh, uh, my question is just about uh, orchestration tools. So a lot of, uh, talking about a lot of orchestration here. How does this play into that uh, part of the ecosystem? Uh, live migration or like our particular use case? Um, you want to schedule a container. You're not scheduling the image anymore. You're scheduling something that you check, you've checkpointed. Right, so I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think questions like that are one of the reasons why this hasn't been merged into Docker yet. <laughs> Uh, because I don't know that there's an obvious answer. I think it's very use case specific. Um, um, yeah, I don't have a good generic answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, have you found performance problems with uh, containers that might be having using a large amount of RAM or a lot of disks? Because is it? I'm assuming it's syncing that file system wise uh, from one host to the other. So if you're using eight gigs of RAM in a container. It is checkpointing that to a file, syncing that over, and then doing a diff? Yes. Um, so if you're using a ton of RAM, it is going to send over the full, a full copy of the file system and a full copy of memory. Um, so Cryo has a bunch of ways to make this a little bit faster. They have what they call incremental checkpoint restore. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll dump the contents of RAM several times um, and look for diffs. And once the di and, and meanwhile, they'll like in the optimized setup, they'll transfer all that stuff while the process is still running. And then once the diff gets small enough, um, that's when they'll actually go checkpoint the process and kill it uh, and send over the smallest amount of data possible. So the idea is that it minimizes the downtime of the process. Um, but yeah, there's no getting around the sort of absolute size of stuff. If you've got eight gigabytes to transfer, that's what you're gonna have to do. Um, uh, if you, of course, are using, like, if it's just a file system issue, and you know that the file system is unchanged on both ends, you know, you don't actually need to transfer it. Like, that, that's some, something you can do at the application level to, to optimize. Yeah, I have a follow-up question on this, uh, on the track memory changes that you were mentioning for the crew. Mm -hmm. Is this support in RunC available, or is? Yes, uh, so this is already available in RunC, and that was actually demoed last year um, at DockerCon. This was the, I think it was a Doom or a Quake demo okay. that they showed on stage. So uh, RunC has a checkpoint restore. Yeah, you can, you can use that right now track. in RunC. And it's also in Container D as well, so if you're using that, which probably not very many people are at this point. Um, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what happens with uh, file handles, for instance, when you're um, migrating between hosts and let's say you have like uh, Docker volumes mounted. Um, is it enough to just have the same Docker volume mounted in the like new location, or is um, it going to get really yes, sad? Yes, it should, it should work. So Cryo is also kind of, uh, it, it knows a lot about the mount points, and it also knows about the specifics of the namespaces, and it's actually able to go ahead and swap out uh, all the namespaces that were created for the first container with the namespaces for the new container. So at restore time, it can sort of create links that theoretically shouldn't be possible. All right, one last question maybe. Anybody? No, so a big round of applause for Ross again. Thank you very much. Thank you.